Hey everyone, this is Mason and you're listening to the Herb Rally Podcast. Today's episode is sponsored by our good friends at Mountain Rose Herbs. The folks at Mountain Rose Herbs are committed to providing us herbalists with high quality, organic and sustainable herbs, spices, essential oils, bulk ingredients, and much more. But quality isn't the only thing they're passionate about. They consider the environmental and social impact of every business decision they make and are dedicated to keeping their business practices sustainable and ethical from start to finish. To Mountain Rose Herbs, people, plants, and planet are more important than profit. And now, Herb Rally listeners can get 10% off their order at mountainroseherbs.com. Just use the code HERBRALLY10 during checkout. That's HERBRALLY10, all one word. Oh, and just an FYI, they also have a great podcast. It's called Herbal Radio. So be sure to search for their podcast on Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you happen to listen to podcasts. So thanks to Mountain Rose Herbs again for sponsoring the podcast. Don't forget to use Herb Rally 10 for 10% off your next order. Now on to the show. Enjoy. A leaf, a flower, and a fruit. A series on herbal motifs in the ancient Mediterranean. Part 3, The Fruit Motif featuring pomegranate. Hello again, my name is Maria Christodoulou and I am a clinical herbalist exploring the wisdom and whimsy of ancient Greek herbal medicine. You can also call me the Greek herbalist. In this third and final session in this three-part series, we will be exploring the fruit motif with the juicy, sweet, and cherished pomegranate. Let's learn why six kernels were responsible for our winter doldrums, and how the ancient people honored the fertile symbolism of this luscious fruit. Called the fruit of the dead by the ancient Greeks, pomegranates have a special place in the underworld. This is all because of Hades, the mythic Greek god of the underworld and all the deceased. In one well-known Greek myth, Hades abducts Persephone while she's picking daffodils, or narcissus flowers, in a meadow. Persephone was the daughter of Zeus, the king of the gods, and Demeter, the goddess of agriculture and fertility. Hades brings Persephone to the underworld, unbeknownst to her parents, to make her his bride. While she is missing, her mother Demeter becomes despondent and until she can see her daughter again, her grief makes the earth barren, causing widespread famine for people all over the world. Zeus sends Hermes, the messenger of the gods, down to the underworld to convince Hades to return Persephone to the world and her grieving mother. Hermes' mission is successful, although partly. In the Homeric hymn to Demeter, Hades says to Persephone, Go now, Persephone, to your dark-robed mother. Go and feel kindly in your heart towards me, but not so exceedingly cast down, for I shall be no unfitting husband for you among the deathless gods, that I am a brother to Father Zeus. And while you are here, you shall rule all that lives and moves, and shall have the greatest rights among the deathless gods those who defraud you and do not appease your power with offerings, reverently performing rites and paying fit gifts, shall be punished forevermore. Hades releases her. However, as Persephone journeys out from the underworld, he tricks her into eating six pomegranate seeds. A rule of the underworld was that anyone who consumed food or drink was doomed to spend eternity there. Since Persephone had eaten the six pomegranate seeds, she was bound to the same rule. Hades, however, agreed to finagle the rule and keep her for just six months of every year, while the other six she would be with her mother to make the land fertile again. This is how the ancient Greeks explained the cycle of the seasons. When Persephone was with her mother, the earth flourished, and the crops grew in the seasons of spring and summer. And when Persephone was with Hades in the underworld, as his bride, the earth was barren and cold in the seasons of autumn and winter. But every year, Persephone's return from the underworld is marked by the arrival of spring and its fertile bounty of colors and vegetation. 
A reenactment of this myth is said to have been the basis of the Eleusinian mysteries, the most sacred and mysterious of ancient Greek rituals, of which scholars know very little about. Pomegranate is, however, one of the foods actually prohibited from the ritual. In addition to being a symbol of death and the underworld, pomegranates also symbolized life, marriage, and fertility. In rituals, they were offered to the goddess Demeter in prayer for fertile land. The fruit was also associated with Aphrodite, the Greek goddess of love, beauty, and passion, and with Hera, the Greek goddess of marriage and childbirth. In ancient Greek art, Hera is often depicted extending a pomegranate in her hand as a blessing for marriage and fertility. In ancient Greece, the pomegranate was called Roa in connection with Hera's mother, the earth goddess Rhea. In ancient Rome, Hera's counterpart was called Juno. There, newly married women wore crowns woven from pomegranate leaves to signify their marital status. Many ancient civilizations also believed that the pomegranate seeds symbolized abundance and good fortune. A celebratory custom adopted from ancient times, Greeks today smash a pomegranate fruit on the ground on New Year's Day. This is a way to mark the new year and release an abundance of good fortune on the household. At the Olympics, the ancient Greeks decorated temples and statues with the pomegranate. The ancient Greek historian Herodotus tells us that during the Greco-Persian Wars in the 400 BCE, Persian soldiers carried spears adorned with golden and silver pomegranates on the tips as a symbol of strength. The pomegranate motif appears in many ancient works of art and literature. On the Greek islands of Santorini and Milos, ancient urns were found with depictions of pomegranates. And on Crete, paintings of pomegranate were identified from as early as the 17th century BCE during the Minoan civilization, the earliest known civilization in Greece. A brass pomegranate discovered at the Acropolis sits on display at the National Archaeological Museum in Athens. Representations of the fruit were painted on Egyptian tomb walls, symbolizing life after death. In 1323 BCE, King Tutankhamun was buried with a pomegranate-shaped silver vase and a painted ivory pomegranate spoon. The pomegranate was the symbol promising an afterlife. In the ruins of Pompeii, archaeologists found charred roots of pomegranates, and surviving Roman fresco paintings illustrate pomegranates indicating their popularity in the ancient Roman world. Ancient writers abundantly mention pomegranate. The renowned Roman Epicurean Apicius featured pomegranates in his cookbook. Pliny the Younger in the first century AD wrote about the famed Roman gardens and frescoes of his time, which featured hedges of pomegranates and roses. The villa of an empress featured a fresco with the same plans. The ancient Romans imported the fruit from Carthage and called the fruit Punica Malum, which translates to Venetian apple. A typical Roman meal traditionally ended with fruit, such as the pomegranate. In Egypt, pomegranates were required at the pharaoh's residence. When Cleopatra held a royal feast for Anthony, one of the foods on the menu was pomegranates. Among the region, it was common practice to make a red dye from the blossom and the peel was also used for dyeing leather. A worldly fruit, the pomegranate was revered for its ability to promise abundance with its bounty of juicy kernels inside. The symbolism of pomegranate is shared among many world religions, reflecting on the themes of life and death, rebirth and eternal life, fertility and marriage, and abundance of life's blessings. 
In Judaism, pomegranates were given to Moses to demonstrate the fertility of the promised land. In the Song of Solomon, the cheeks of a bride behind her veil are compared to the two halves of a pomegranate fruit. Let us go early to the vineyards to see if the pomegranates are in bloom. There I will give you my love. Song of Solomon 7.12 The fruit is included in the love chamber along with mandrake, myrrh, frankincense, saffron, and cinnamon. The fruit motif adorned the pillars of ancient temples as well as the regalia of Jewish kings. In Christianity, the fruit is depicted in paintings of the Virgin Mary and baby Jesus to represent his resurrection and the promise of everlasting life. In the Orthodox Christian Church, the fruit motif is woven onto sacred vestments worn by priests. In the Holy Book of the Koran, pomegranates grew in paradise in the Garden of Eden and were were referred to as one of God's good creations. Some traditions believed pomegranate to be the real forbidden fruit instead of the apple. The Bedouins, a nomadic Arab tribe in the Middle East, celebrated pomegranates as a fertility symbol at weddings. In Buddhism, the pomegranate is one of the three blessed fruits. In one legend, a female demon was cured of her evilness when the Buddha gave her a pomegranate to eat. In China, the pomegranate is a common motif for wedding gifts and in ceramic art to symbolize fertility and abundance. The pomegranate shrub itself is beautiful to behold with bold and bright red flowers. Strangely enough, botanically, the pomegranate fruit is actually a berry. Pomegranate is highly nutritious, high in antioxidants, vitamins A, B, C, and minerals such as phosphorus, potassium, sodium, and iron. In ancient medicine, the pomegranate flower, fruit, and bark were widely used throughout antiquity. The Romans drank the juice of pomegranates to treat infertility. The Egyptians drank the juice, which they called skedju, to kill intestinal worms. Several Roman medical writers noted the use of pomegranate rind and root bark as a treatment for tapeworm. Throughout antiquity, pomegranate was used for intestinal disorders, gout, stomach cramps, and as a mouthwash. It was also considered an aphrodisiac. In his book, De Materia Medica, the herbalist Dioscorides recommended the pomegranate, called roa, or Carthaginian apple, with two or three sprigs of peppermint, mentha sativa, taken in a drink to soothe hiccups, vomiting, and bile. He also mentions the juice of rue, ruta gravelins, warmed in a pomegranate rind and dropped in the ears to be good for ear sores. The dried rind of the fruit was often used as a vessel to mix and heat liquid substances. Even today, the fruit is a symbol in the coat of arms of several medical associations. It is perhaps not surprising that bountiful plants like pomegranate were celebrated in cultural, religious, and medicinal contexts throughout history. Plants are a true wonder, and their journey through time gives us just a glimpse of how important they are to all people everywhere at all times. I hope you have enjoyed this three-part series exploring herbal motifs in the ancient Mediterranean with the fig leaf, the rose flower, and the pomegranate fruit. Feel free to contact me at maria at thegreekherbalist.com for any questions and stay tuned for future sessions on the fascinating ancient Mediterranean world. In the meantime, for other adventures through antiquity, you can join me at thegreekherbalist.com. Hey everyone, this is Mason with Herb Rally again. Uh, just before you go, I wanted to let you know about three freebies that are currently being offered on Herb Rally. There's an ebook by Rosalie de la Foyer on calendula and skin care. There's an 80 something or so page ebook by our friends over at Plant Healer. And there's also an hour long class on adaptogens by herbalist Heather Irvine. So all of that's for free when you sign up for the Herb Rally newsletter. 
To sign up for the newsletter, just go to herbrally.com, and in the menu at the top, you'll see a button that says newsletter. Just click on that link. You'll sign up for the newsletter, and you'll have access to the three freebies. So the newsletter also has a bunch of great info in it. You'll get updates on new podcast releases, monograph releases, and anything else that's going on over at Herb Rally. You'll also hear about upcoming events, courses, and anything else that's going on in the herbal world. So thanks again for listening. If you ever want to reach out to me with podcast ideas or anything else, you could contact me at mason at herbrally.com. Thanks so much for listening, and until next time, take care.